Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are continuing our senior citizens theme this month with da -da, Lisa Lada. Welcome, Lisa. Hi. And today, of course, since we got Lisa on, we're going to be really concentrating on on older grays. That's a topic today, older grays. So um, I see you got your grays. They're all like just chilling in the background there. They're all doing the same thing. It's really cute. They're all preening. Um, so uh, yeah, so I can't wait. That, that's uh, you know, I guess with with grays, you know, they um, they're already gray, so it's hard to tell their age. <laughs> well, you kind of can. We'll get into that. Uh, and if I if for some reason I don't touch on that, remind me at the end. Okay. So okay. All right. I will. I will. Um, all right. Uh, so let's see. If you're just joining us, yes, you're at the right webinar. We are talking about older grays today. And I guess also it's gonna kind of go out into other uh, applies to other birds, other species, but we'll do a special focus on grays. So, um, and Lisa, I'm sure uh, you have fabulous uh, share for us again, slide, a slide deck show for us. All right, yes. all right. And uh, I'm very happy that a lot of people on my gray page participated in this one. We're gonna see an awful lot of pictures um, and all little stars from everyone who sent in their bird pictures. Oh, so, nice. Okay. Yes. So uh, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, I'm I'm imagine uh, that hopefully we'll we'll have time for questions at the end. So let's let's kickstart this so we we get to the nitty gritty and also have time for questions um, towards the end. Oh, and that is a reminder that if you do have a question, use the Q and A button, not the chat feature, so we can capture it. So with that, I will let you have it. <laughs> Sounds good. Just give me a second to move stuff around here. All right. Oops, don't pay attention to that. I'm trying to move this great big bar that's in the middle of everything. <laughs> all right, all right. I wanna thank everybody for joining in today. And we're gonna talk about the older gray. Um, I can't believe it's the 23rd uh, part of the gray way series. And thanks for everybody for making this possible. So I have to tell you that a lot of this webinar was, um, done while I was sitting in my RV. Um, I apologize last month for not being here. We had to go back to New Jersey to uh, lay our daughter to rest and we came home and we had no heat. So down here, things are a little bit different with the heat thing, uh, heat and air conditioning units. So we had to have a brand one, new one put in and I couldn't have the birds in the house. So we sat out in the RV for many days um, and there I am working on the webinar, so I hope you guys enjoy. When is an African gray considered old? Really, a lot of the people that I know, their birds usually go into the 30s. I certainly hope it's a lot older than that because a lot of my birds are heading towards 30s, in their 30s, or in their 40s. What I did is a lot of research, and there's going to be a lot of different links in here that you can refer back to when we are done to go back and read some of the research and articles that I referenced because they were great and it'll help you, especially if you have some older grades, to know what you're looking for, what to discuss with your vet and how to handle things. And it, you know me, I like to quote a lot of veterinarians and that's what we got going on here. So I would personally think with my page, I asked for people that had grades that were about 12 and older. The reason is because I was always told that they usually start finding heart issues around 12. That is still very young, but that's where I started asking for pictures of the birds 12 up. I really think middle age for these guys are going to be starting in their 20s again, but because the heart issues are, are starting in the teens for different reasons, that's why we're starting younger. The birds have a slower aging rate and their cellular mechanisms are different and allows them to have a longer lifespan compared to other birds that are or other animals that are the same size. So 
here we have Murphy and he has heart disease and he's on daily heart meds and he's syringe trained, which is fantastic. His red feathering was from birth. It's not any kind of disease that some of them do have a lot more red factor uh, in them than others. And everybody always says right off the bat, it's disease. It could be genetics. We'll talk about that as well. So how long do they really live? And now, Dr. Lamb talked about this last week. My last webinar was about internet chatter, and I see it all the time. Birds, African greys live to 80, and I don't know any that have ever reached 80. Um, reported lifespan in the literature books are going to be 48-ish. And Dr. Lamb has said she has personally seen patients in their late 50s, which gives me a lot of hope. And um, because I want my guys and I want all your guys to stay around for a long time. So we're going to talk about some health issues. There's there's more to cover. But I do not have personal experience with them. So possibly what you want to do is look into Dr. Oros has done a lot of webinars and stuff on older grays and oh, or actually older birds, geriatric birds. She's done articles. I've referenced them a lot in here. And you might want to catch up on some of that stuff to read more issues that can be, be detected. So when you have a bird that's sick, they don't really show the signs until it's they're kind of very ill. Um, owners that pay a lot of attention are going to recognize small differences in their birds, such as not vocalizing or being a li little bit more tired or not wanting to um, interact with family members. Um, and you have to watch your birds on a daily basis. If you see anything like this, start taking notes, take a journal, and don't hesitate to go to the vet if you notice these early signs. Early signs and knowing the difference is what's going to help your bird get better. So what are the signs that your bird may be having something going on or feeling ill? We have not grasping the perches correctly. These are all signs that I've seen with my own through the years. I'm going on, I think, my 47th year of living with all different types of birds. 20-something, possibly even 30-something with grays. And if I see one of my birds not grasping the perch correctly, yes, they will sit there with one foot up at times when they're resting or when they're sleeping or they're comfortable. But if you see one foot maybe balled up or you see the toes aren't laying flat on the perch, that's a sign to start watching for other things. Not sitting correctly on the perch. That was a big concern with one of my birds when I came home uh, from Florida visiting family. One of my birds was actually almost laying down on the perch. So the first thing I did was contacted my vet, made an appointment, and went in. And we'll see his x-rays a little bit later in the webinar. Not showing interest in eating. You know, just like us, sometimes we're really not in the mood at that specific time something's placed in front of us. If you see this is going on for a couple hours and the bird's not showing interest in eating something it always has, I'm not saying new things because they might not realize what the new thing is, but if they're not showing interest in something they've always eaten, keep your eyes on them. Not moving around as much as in the cage. They're sitting in one spot, maybe they're resting a little bit more. Um, watch the activity level. As I said, resting more, sleeping more. Having a longer respiratory recovery rate after a short flight. Um, average is gonna be one to two minutes for a short flight. Obviously longer flights or big you know, outdoor flights, it's gonna be longer than that, um, depending on how strenuous it is. Uh, I'm not talking a short jump. I'm talking actually flapping and getting somewhere. So if your bird's showing a longer respiratory recovery rate, you want to make sure that you keep an eye on them. Labor breathing. 
Watch for that tail bob. That's severe respiratory distress. That can mean a lot of different things. If you notice that underneath the beak seems to be expanding as they breathe, that's respiratory distress. Uh, my one bird was doing that and I didn't quite understand what he was doing. He wasn't making sounds, but I could see that white patch coming out underneath. It was because his nares were clogged after the vet pulled everything out of there which you should never do on your own. It has to be done by a vet. I was amazed that everything came out of there and he's been breathing normal ever since. That was a first for me, having birds all my life, not noticing or not knowing all that stuff that gets caught in there. Wobbly looking or as if they're gonna pass out. That's what happened with Abby. She was an avid flyer. She flew all over the house. I encouraged this and I noticed that when she landed, she was wobbly or she was so um, exhausted, she looked like she was gonna pass out. That is not normal, that you need to get to your vet immediately. Falling off perches, again, if you have this happen, you wanna look, if the bird's always been fine with it and, and it's starting to fall off the perches, you've got an issue. If you put a new perch in there and they're falling off, you have to look at the diameter of the perch and how slippery it is. Manzanita and Java are very slippery. So I usually tell people to rough them up maybe with a little sandpaper or my husband loves me. I'll take a knife and I'll like kind of carve into it a little bit. Um, and that makes it less slippery. So you want to look at different things. And again, if it's a perch you've always had in there and they're suddenly falling off, get to your bed. So seizures can really happen at any age and they can be a sign of a more serious issue. Um, this is actually Cookie and, and Cookie does have seizures and she, Cookie started having seizures about 16 years ago. So this is from a good friend of mine. I've followed Cookie's um, well-being through the years. She's a very dedicated person. She takes care of him very well and he's on two different medications. Um, you know, every day to try to prevent these seizures. Now, this could be um, leading into maybe more heart related issues. This is something to discuss with your vet. It's not something that it, there's no reason behind it. Um, I see a lot of people online that post videos of their birds and say, what do you want to do? The correct response, go to the vet. So how can you tell if your bird is having a seizure? There are three parts to the seizure. The initial phase is called the aura phase. Second, case, second phase is called the ictus. Um, that's when they're pretty much disorientated and um, the body will become stiff and jerk. And it's not pretty. It's scary for them and for us. And that usually lasts about five to 20 seconds. Then it's the post-ictal phase. And that lasts sev several minutes to hours. They'll be exhausted. They won't move much. They'll be confused. They'll probably be bitey um, because they don't understand what's going on. Then they're restless. And again, make sure you get to the vet. So checkers, as far as I know, is a healthy bird. You're going to see that I had so many people respond to my request for pictures that I had to put birds all over the place. So if there's an issue with a specific bird, on the, the page that I know that's having an issue, we'll discuss it a little bit. Um, not to go into detail, because it's really not my business or anybody else's, but what they're doing to try to manage it. So this is Checkers. Checkers is a healthy little bird, but we needed to put Checkers somewhere in here. So what happens if your bird is having seizures? You wanna lower your perches. You wanna pad the bottom of the cage. Now, I usually would take like a, a towel, as long as it doesn't have big loops on it because you don't want toenails getting caught in it because they are going to be flapping around on there. So if you put a towel with a very tight weave and you put um, paper towels on top of that. So this way, if the bird defecates, you can change it quickly and often so they're not rolling around in there. Lift the bottom of the cage. If you have a tall, high cage, you don't want the bird dropping five feet. You want to lift the grate of the cage up so there's fall, smaller um, spot to fall. A lot of people, what they'll do is they'll lower the perches, which, it, like I said, is a good idea. But a lot of times the birds want to be up higher, so they'll be hanging upside down at the top of the cage, 
and they still have this option of falling and getting hurt. So you can do a smaller hospital cage or you can do a wider than taller cage and that will help out. And then of course, you're gonna have to go to your vet and then you're gonna have to get medications to control it. There's nothing you can find online. No one online can help. You need to get to the vet. Liver problems. Um, a lot of times this happens with older birds as well. This is actually going to be my Otis. He was my first African gray. Uh, he was a wild caught, rowdy little bird. Uh, I don't really know how old he was when he passed away. I would say he was probably somewhere in his late 20s because he was with me for 13 of those years. And I know he was not a youngster when he got there. Um, I tried looking up his bands um, with the import bands, didn't have much luck, so it's a guess. But he beat aspergillosis only to pass on from liver issues. So what causes liver disorders in birds? Um, we're gonna pass over what you, you're reading there because obviously that happens um, to a lot of birds with the bacterial, fungal, viral, and that. Um, other, could, other causes could be tumors, um, circulatory disturb, uh, disturbances. This is gonna happen with older birds. Um, my young Emma, um, she was probably maybe about six when she was diagnosed with liver issues. Uh, we went on, we took her to the vet. We went on some medications. She's doing well. Um, but again, this happens a lot from incorrect diets, um, high in fats. You have to be careful. I say a lot of people feeding egg, pro egg products every day. You got a lot of high cholesterols. You got a lot of things that aren't really good. Your bird doesn't need to have a big thing of French fries or potato chips. Um, you got to think about the size of them compared to the size of you. And all that stuff is not good and you're not contributing to your bird's health. You're declining it. So um, Emma went through all these different tests. Uh, she did not have the, uh, the laparoscopic and she didn't have the liver biopsy because that is going to be more invasive and we didn't need to do that at first, but we were able to get her on some uh, good medications. And like I said, she's doing well. So how is it, how is the daughter disorder treated in birds? This is actually Emma's leg. That was the first sign I noticed she was sick because she doesn't pluck. I woke up one morning and that's what she looked like. So I called my vet and I made, well, I called the vet office. I made an appointment. They said I couldn't come in for probably two or three days. I don't remember what it was, probably three days. Um, I sent this picture along. The next day I woke up and Emma's entire chest and down to her vent were completely naked. And she was as red as red could be. So I ended up packing up Emma that day and I walked into the vet office and I sat there. I kind of like passed the uh, front desk and I sat in the waiting room. And eventually I knew my vet would come out and she did. She came out and she says, what are you doing here? Your appointment's not till tomorrow. I said, Emma needs to be seen. Look at her. And Emma was in liver failure. So um, again, we caught it earlier. This is day one, how she looked. Day two, she was naked. Eye issues. I asked Dr. Lamb a question last week because this is actually my Sterling's eye. So he also has arthritis. And I thought maybe the, you know, the medication that he's on for this was affecting his eyesight. I've never seen it before. Sterling's 41. So what is causing this issue? And it's, it's even worse on the other eye. So last week when I asked this question, Sterling has been to the vet. Um, it's not from the medications that he's on. It's a thinning of the iris. And Dr. Lamb told me last week, it's also a uveal cyst. It's no harm. It's not losing his sight. They're tiny little bubbles that are popping up possibly. This did not come from her. This is my thought. Um, talking with two different beds. Possibly the iris is getting thinner. I was told macaw irises, as they get older, they do get thinner. 
So perhaps this is it because of the light color. I'm seeing it more. Um, we're going to go back a slide because Laura had mentioned in the beginning that you can't really tell because the birds are gray, the age of a bird. Well, I have noticed, and I want all my people with their birds really in the late 30s and 40s, I want them to look around that white patch on their skin. I actually notice a lot of wrinkles um, right behind the eye here. It's not as smooth as my younger birds. I've noticed it with my friends when I've gone to their houses because oddly enough, the majority of my friends have grays. I've been there, I've looked at their birds. I could tell their older birds by looking at the white patches of their skin. That's the only thing that really changes, okay? Then we're gonna talk a little bit about cataracts. Again, Dr. Lamb talked about this last week. If you did not see her webinar, I highly suggest that you do. This is cataracts. Um, we were told that cataracts um, can happen for a lack of selenium in their diet, especially with the grays. Now, I'm not telling you to run out and get selenium. I'm telling you that this is an issue that has been noted. And it's something that if you see something you want to talk to your vet about. Now, it usually affects both eyes. And if they are bad enough, there can be surgery done on them. I'm not sure how much of it's really done just yet. Um, I don't know how long they've been doing it. I don't know all the different success rates. Uh, Dr. Lamb said they do not put a new lens in there. I uh, know that I've had several birds that have had um, eye issues and have not been able to see. One of my cockatiels had cataracts very bad in both eyes and he still got around just fine. So if you have a bird that's getting this, perhaps you wanna to talk to your vet about diet to see if there's anything you could do to try to put it off more. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have the cage pretty much. You can move little things, but don't be moving perches. Don't be moving big things that the bird's gonna to need to feel with his beak to move around. Um, I don't really know anybody on my page my African Grey page on Facebook. We have like 9,000 members. I don't really know anybody on there that has a Grey with cataracts just yet to talk about, but I can only go with my cockatiel and know that he had a severely bad in both eyes and he did well. So what causes cataracts? Um, it could be metabolic diseases, you know, nutritional problems. A lot of this comes down to nutritional with all the things that we're talking about, um, they found with canaries, cataracts can be inherited. So genetic, we're gonna talk about that. Um, they're usually age-related and have and, and affect both eyes. Now, again, look at the ages of these birds here, all right? They're all from my page. They're all doing well. Nobody has cataracts, just wanted to share them. So we have foot issues. So, Photodermatitis, actually known by the layman as bumblefoot. Um, that's how we refer to it online. It's easier for us people that are not vets to remember. It's relatively common in older birds because of um, they're sitting on their feet for so long. So just, you know, they, they can't change their sneakers when their feet hurt or put on nice slippers like we do. So they're constantly standing on their feet for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So if you have all hardwood perches, all the same diameter perches where they can't exercise or they can't sit on something softer, you're gonna end up with an issue long-term. I have been fortunate Maybe because none of my birds have the same perches. They have their options of where they can sit on diameters and, and different textures. Um, I hope I never have this issue. I'm going to knock on wood here. Um, my guys are all getting older. So this can happen because of fractures. Um, you know, they're more at risk when they have fractures or they're obese or they're on a poor diet. And it can predisposition them to getting arthritis. So here, Jazzy, 
absolutely fine jazzy has um a rope perch so that's a little bit softer on her feet i like the fact that this perch is out of the cage so it can be monitored to make sure she's not chewing on it and ingesting any of the pieces but this is a great little option to give them a nice softer more slipper you know like perch so here we have max so what can we do max is fine too what can we do with perches, if your bird does have bumblefoot, first off, to the vet. Get it taken care of sooner than later, because I've seen some pretty nasty pictures. I didn't want to use any of them on here. Um, sooner to catch it, the better. So if you have a bird that's having issues, you can wrap their perches. Okay, you can use vet wrap. It's going to be the best um, because you can change that more often um, and keep it clean versus, you know, you have something else they're going to chew on. You can, there, you can get a flat perch. There's a whole bunch of different flat perches out there. Again, it's different diameters, different textures. It's not putting pressure points on those pads and in the uh, you know, foot of uh, the birds. So they have flat perches made out of all different kinds of materials. I happen to like the ones that are made out of the wire. Um, I don't know the exact name, but it's the same wire or same uh, steel that the cages are made out of. They make corner perches, they make platform perches, and this way the bird's not pooping on it, and yet their toes can hang down in a little bit more of a natural state than, say, a wood perch that's completely flat that you're going to have to take out, you're going to have to disinfect, you're going to have to take care of it. Medications, and of course, with your vet, you might need to have surgery, but you can manage it that way and help it to get better. And then you can actually do laser therapy. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think they might be doing this for some arthritic birds as well. Um, I have not had to deal with that, but this is um, something that was discussed with me with one of my birds who we know will have arthritis down the road. So some of this is helping. Here we go. We have arthritis and older birds are, uh, are more prone to have osteoarthritis. So here we have Benji who is 25. Even though she's very young, she's very arthritic and she is on medication for that. We, She was a um, rescue at a certain rescue and she was found a, a very good home. I helped place this bird um, with an excellent owner that I know is going to spoil her and take her very good care of her um but she is going to need supplements um supplemental care for the rest of her life because whatever happened in her past is now showing up now and it's giving her a lot of issues then we have igor he's 28 um i am not aware of him having arthritis yet but i know from having a bird with a curved neck and spine um that eventually these birds will get it in their neck, probably from the position who knows if they'll get it in their spine. Um, I was made aware of this with my own little Emma, um, probably when she was about five or six. Um, you know, I'm going to have to watch out because she also has a twisted neck and spine. So Osteoarthritis is common in generic birds, or geriatric birds, excuse me, and could lead to other issues such as bumblefoot if not caught early and treated. Uh, the weight of the bird, general condition, injuries, concurrent medical conditions can all contribute to the onset and severity of arthritis. So here we are looking at Sterling's x-ray. This is my 41 year old African gray. This is the one who is laying down when I came home from Florida. And I, I, I seriously mean completely laying down on his perch. I don't know how he didn't fall off. Not normal, called my vet, got him up there. And, um, I have another slide, I thought it was after this, that's going to show you his, his hip joint um, is out of whack with the other one. Now, it could have been from a fall, could have been from landing hard. It could have been, I do believe he's wild caught. It could be from when he was caught. 
um, but we will look into that. So you wanna keep an eye on your birds. So here we have Wren, again, another twisted neck bird who's probably going to have some issues. And here is little Emma. Um, I know she looks sweet here, but she doesn't like um, strangers, bird sitters, or anybody else in the house because she will go on uh, um, high alert and she becomes extremely feisty with everybody. But she has a twisted neck and spine. And when I took her many years ago into the doctor, they wanted to take an x-ray of her to compare with her as she got older. At that point, I declined. It wasn't my regular veterinarian. Um, they were great vets, but I am, um, I'm a hard client. And I wanted to make sure that all my other vets, when we discussed, um, if that's what she needed to do, that's what we're going to do. We decided to hold off. She didn't need it, but I know what to watch for her. If she starts acting differently, um, you know, not as active, um, it's time to go in and have it looked at. So here we have Sterling, um, maybe his little x-rays after he's 41. Here he is. He looks nice and bright and alert. You can see his eyes there. This was not all that long ago. This was probably four months ago. And you can see in his eyes, he does not have those spots. It's kind of hard to tell his little wrinkles on his face. You can see by the little pads of his foot down here, you can see that it's a little bit more callous maybe or a little, little bit thicker. Um, that's also an older bird trait. Here we go, here's his x-rays. So you can see here on the left hip is going to be more normal, okay? And then over here, it's at a different angle. And this is why he is on medication. So he had something with his hip and I believe his knee. Um, I don't remember what it is with the knee, but I see something different here compared to over here. So he has arthritis and he is um, currently on Tosiquin. That's what we decided, the vet and I decided would be the best option for now until he needs something a little bit more heavy duty. Um, and that's the reason I thought he was having issues with his eyes, but it, there's nothing wrong with it. So heart issues, um, this, this is a hard one. This is Abby. Y'all know about little Abigail. Um, she was um, flying all over the house, healthy in every way, except for her little brood patch there. Very active, destroying toys, eats anything you put in front of her. I mean, she looked like the perfect, healthy, robust bird until I saw her almost pass out after flight. And that's because she has heart disease. Um, she is now on two medications. Uh, she's had to have her CAT scans, echocardiograms. She's had x-rays, all kinds of blood work. Um, she will be on this uh, medication for as long as I have her. Um, the damage is done. We're not sure why, because she had um, a, a decent home, you know, when she first started out. She had a great home after that. I know the, the diets were good. Um, she was very spoiled here. She's same thing. Her diet is the same as all my other birds. Um, you know, and they get a lot of different things. And I, and she was able to fly and get her exercise and not restricted. And she is the sickest one in my house. So do we know if that is genetic? Like humans, we get things from our parents. We can pass things on to our children. Um, I just found out where my thyroid disease came from and never knew that for the last 20 years. Um, but yes, it came from my mom. So how do we know that stuff like this is not being passed down from the parent to the chick? So here we have Dusty, 29 years old. And she was uh, pretty sick in July. She's always had a calcium deficiency since she um, first came into her new home. And after her having some issues, um, we had her to the vet and she um, was diagnosed with AG, um, 
which uh, Dr. Oros and Dr. Dahlhausen did some webinars with. If you're not familiar with it, I want you to look that up. Um, and now uh, also has arthritis of the spine and calcified knee joint. So now that her owner knows all this, she knows how to maintain a bird and take care of her. And Dusty just went through a series of um, some pretty invasive shots. And I'm happy to say she is doing well. Um, and I hope for her continued health. Here we have uh, Paris, who's 24. Paris is fine, just needed a picture. Um, heart disease. Um, is associated with coronary artery disease in pet birds. Um, African greys are particularly susceptible. I talked about age 12. That was what was taught to us, whether that's changed, um, but that's what the doctors were finding probably up until maybe three or four years ago. That onset is usually around 12, age 12. So you want to make sure that you're taking care and feeding those babies really good. So less risk. You're not going to totally get rid of it again because it might be something with genetics um but you want to do your best to put it off so um risk factors for sedentary lifestyle which abby did not have high fat diet abby did not have high cholesterol levels at uh, levels abby did not have um she did seem to have breathing issues but only after she flew um, it was, it was not good. Um, she did not appear weak. She did not appear de depressed or lethargic. She tried to continue to fly all over, but I restricted her because I knew something was wrong. So how is heart disease diagnosed? Um, like Abby, some are, they have an inability to fly without discomfort or shortness of breath or breathing difficulties. And so you, you, you go to the vet, they're going to do their blood work. Um, they got diagnostic te techniques that have improved. You're, they're going to do x-rays, electro electrocardiograms, electrocardiograms, and they can continue to do these tests and see and monitor, um, a bird once they have been diagnosed. And that's what we are doing now with Abby. To help reduce the risk of heart disease, a sedentary lifestyle along with diet, unhealthy fats, is a definite health risk to your pet bird. By encouraging some exercise, such as flying, you can help reduce the risk of cardiac issues in your parrots. Now, I don't want to see you taking your birds and throwing them in the air. That's not how you introduce them into flying if, they, if they're not used to it. Um, a lot of people are still clipping wings. Again, it's a controversial subject. No one has the right to tell you what's safe in your home. I am just telling you what is better for their health. So post-diagnosis of, of heart disease is you want to really limit um, them being exerting themselves. Uh, Abby, I'm not going to lie, if I'm walking in, her into her bedroom, she might hop off my, my hand and fly six feet. And of course, my heart stops because now I'm watching to see if she's having any kind of distress. She's doing okay. I'd say 75% better than she was. But that doesn't mean an eight foot fly is not going to send her into having issues. So you really want to try not to overtax the heart. You want to make sure she can climb or they can climb, whether it's up a ladder, whether it's on a tree, whether it's around the cage, you know, with the cage itself, that's going to give them the exercise that they need. And then we're going to talk about genetics. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much. Uh, research has been done on this. Um, if anybody knows of any, please send it along because I'd like to read a little bit more about it. Um, again, I did a lot of research for this. So uh, they're, they're finding out that breeding for different colors and mutations, I mean, we've known that this could make the bird not as healthy. But again, as I spoke about with humans and how we get things, I'm pretty sure that if you have a bird that's having issues and they have babies and it's something they can pass along, we are going to see that. Um, 
in the wild, if a bird is ill and it has one of these issues, they die off. Here in our homes, we have good vets. They help us keep the birds with us and help them lead a good life. So, you know, you want to try to keep an eye on it. If the older birds, the imported birds, they found through the years that they were bigger stock. They were healthier stock. You needed to have, be healthy to survive out there. Through the years, with some captive breeding, there are, uh, let me say this, I have friends that are breeders. There are wonderful breeders out there. We need good breeders. But just as much, you're going to have the backyard ones that don't really know what they're doing. So they might be putting two birds together that really don't have a good background, and then we end up with ill birds. I do believe that Sydney's plucking has a lot to do with his parents that also plucked when I saw them. How diet plays a role in all these different diseases. Um, parrots that are fed a high fat and cholesterol diet will be more likely to experience heart disease. Here we have Ray Ray. She's healthy. She's at a really good rate, uh, weight right there. That's the average for my guys, but know that I also had a large bird, large African gray. He was 680 grams. He was still a very healthy. He was not fat. He did not have a lot of, you know, muscle mass. Um, I mean, you know, around his chest, you could still feel his keel. He was just a huge bird. And Emma's my smallest at 372. So, I've had the gamut of extremely high weights, extremely low rates, and they're still healthy. So here we have Gus and we have Nova. We've talked about nutrition. It's important that you are giving them a formulated diet. Um, again, a lot of people want to go off of just what they read on the internet. And that, that, that is not based on science. It's not, it hasn't been checked. They haven't been watching it for 30, 40, 50 years. These are good things to add. I see they have their, their yellow and orangey vegetables in there, which are great. It's got more nutrition, uh, more exotic. The color, the better the nutrition. So you have these two guys, they're eating well. So their, their caregivers are doing really good with trying to keep them healthy. And this is one thing, it's kind of like a shameless plug, but it's the truth. Um, Many years ago at a show, way before I worked for Lefevers, I went to one of their booths because they were talking about a new product. Now I have, a, I have Emma, who I know is going to have arthritis. She's already had liver disease. And I was standing there talking to the rep. I don't even know who the rep was at that time. But we talked about this product and all the different things that it has in it that I can offer Emma that's going to be more natural and maybe help her along the way. So we we have Ginger because Emma gets car sick and she has, you know, she um, gets a little nervous early, you know, easily. So we wanna make sure that um, she has something that's calming her tummy down. Um, it helps, to, then we have, um, it helps with, Inflammatory issues, helps ease tendonitis, lower cholesterol, blood pressure, and prevent blood clots. Um, it's also it has joint health supplements, glucosamine, and of course I didn't say that right, uh, to combat arthritis and to ease the joint swelling. So they have cranberries and um that are full of antioxidants that strengthen the immune system and flush out harmful toxins. And dates are iron rich fruits. So all this stuff that's in this specific formula, my guys get every day. It doesn't really matter, you know, the size for your grades. If you want to try the larger one that's made from a closet, it's really the same type of formulation. Um, it's age combative ingredients include milk thistle, dandelion, ginger. Um, it's got pellets in there. It's got wholesome grains and fruits. So I highly suggest that you guys try this and use it as part of your, um, your diet plan going forward. 
how exercise plays a role. And again, Abby was one of the most active birds I've ever had. Um, you want to make sure that your, your bird has proper diet, exercise being key ingredients to help. Um, feed them a healthy diet, skip them fatty foods, high in cholesterol, and make sure your feather friends get significant time outside the cage to spread its wings, flap, and carry on, and keep their heart in good shape. This is also something that was talked about last week. And again, on the bottom, there are some links for you to go in and read. Uh, I know a lot of people that have bird rooms and I have one too. Um, I've always had bird rooms, but my birds don't live in a bird room. They come out and they are with family because we are their flock, especially if you have a single bird. I've known a lot of people through the years who sad to say they've put the birds in a room by themselves and just left them there. And then we've found out through the years that social, social isolation shortens telemeters in African gray parrots. Um, and of course, um, you want to make sure that you have the birds out and they're stimulated and they're part of the family. This can happen because of different stress related issues, um, being alone. So again, follow that link down there, come back, uh, review it, get to that link and go read and try to give your, your birds a really good life. Here we have Pepper. Um, Pepper had some health issues. She's doing well now. Um, we're gonna get into some of the birds and some of the people that uh, sent in some pictures. So these are the younger birds that got in here. So we have anywhere really, I think I had a 10 year old up to a 19 year old. From what I understand, all these birds are healthy. Their parents are doing really good jobs, uh, feeding them, letting them exercise. You can see the birds are not in their cage. It's all the things that they're supposed to be doing. I love this picture in the middle of Bingo. She really looks like she can't be bothered with another picture. Um, here we have birds that are going into their 20s. So we have my Sydney there. Um, besides his little mental problems, uh, other than that, he's doing quite well. Then we have Rosita and Sigmund. Um, they're both later age. They're doing well. Here we have a lot of people, and you can see the, the ages from 21 up to 29. A lot of the people um, in this, this age group uh, with birds are on my, my page. And from what I understand, these birds are all doing well. Again, you can see they're not in their cages. Um, they're getting good diets and they're being enriched. So now, the 20s seem to be the biggest group of people on my page. Now we have Sammy and people going into their 30s. So this is where I start to really get happy because this is showing me that birds can go on and live longer um, if they're being taken care of, they're healthy, and their genetics are good. I don't want anybody to ever think because you lost a younger bird that you didn't do something right. Um, I lost one at age two and a half. Uh, I did everything in the world possible and he still died. Um, that doesn't make me a bad owner. It meant that he had something that came from his parents and he was just a little time bomb that we didn't know about. And unfortunately he passed away. Um, we do have two, um, special able birds on the page here. We have Thumper over here to the left and we have Sammy. Um, they're in the same, uh, same home and, they're little stars here. They have uh, they have no feet, but they get around really good. Then this is actually, uh, this used to be part of my flock. This is the bird I grew up with. This is Bubba and he is 40. He's just a little bit younger than Sterling. Oops. Um, he was my dad's bird. So one of the things we need to talk about, um, and we will get into that, is the older birds and how long they're gonna live. So this is Bubba. And these are some of the 40 year olds that are on my page. Um, I didn't get the name over here, it wasn't listed, so I apologize. Um, but these are my 40 year olds on the page. This guy uh, gets a special shout out because he's 59 and he is well taken care of, very happy. I couldn't attach the picture of him dancing, but um, He's doing quite well and in the hands of Tallgrass Parrot Sanctuary. 
So the last thing we need to really touch on is outliving us. Again, this is Bubba. Um, when my dad got sick, I took both the birds into my house. Bubba um, never really cared for me. He was never relaxed with me. He never wanted to interact with me, no matter how hard I tried. Um, I remember being around a table at a newsletter meeting for my bird club, and this bird would come over and stand in front of me on the edge of the table and throw things at me, whatever he can get. He just wanted me away. So when he had to come live with me, when my dad got ill, uh, he was not happy. He was not thriving. He was not interacting. He wasn't eating. Um, he was just deteriorating. So I have a friend there, Rick, and he took this bird in. Um, he also knew my family. He knew my dad. He was part of my bird club. And Bubba thrived with him. And uh, last December, Rick passed away. And we were in a desperate um, mode to get this bird along with um, the other African gray they had, he had out of his house that was now empty up in New York state in the middle of a snowstorm. So um, his little angel um, came up from Texas. Uh, we had a little birdie train from New York to Maryland to North Carolina, to South Carolina, to Texas. And now Bubba is doing very well in his new home. Um, Lucille there can do more things with him than I could ever dream. So that means he's happy. I know Rick is happy. But we have to think about older birds and outliving us because the majority of the people that I know are going to be in that have birds, whether it's a McCall, Gray, um, the larger birds that live longer lives, people are going to be in my age. They're going to be empty nesters. They're going to be people that don't have children and wanted something to kind of, I can't say fill that void, but something they can interact with a little bit more than a dog or a cat. Um, so what I all want you to do is if you have not, here we go. Phoenix Landing had a wonderful speaker. Um, you can see it on YouTube. This is going to explain to you what you can do to set up your birds if your parrots outlive you. You want to make sure you have plans in place so they're taken care of because you're not always going to have that birdie train to get them on to the next stage of their life. So don't leave them hanging. And even though Bubba was always supposed to come back to me and it was known between Rick and I, had I not got a call from his veterinarian to let me know he was sick, I would have never known because he wasn't online. So uh, the stars aligned, but there's a lot of birds that don't have that in place. And a lot of times we find them too late. So make sure you go to their website, you go to their YouTube, you watch this, get your ducks in order, as they say, and make sure your birds are taken care of. So here's your links when you come back and, and grab them all, or we'll leave it up here for a minute if you want to copy and paste, if you're able to. I'm not sure if you can do that on PowerPoint. Um, but these are some excellent articles, some things I referenced. Um, and just know the one on the bottom is going to have a lot of necropsy photos. So if you're not comfortable with that, stay away from that. Um, that little artwork there, that's from Neil. He's on Facebook. He has some great pictures, uh, follow his page and you can laugh along with the rest of us. I wanna thank everybody for joining in. Hopefully we have a couple minutes to ask some questions and thank you for being here. Thank you, Lisa. Those are some, wow. Those are some really important takeaways, um, especially towards the end. Yeah, for sure. That was, uh, let's see, we do have questions. Um, so this one is from Rhonda. Um, are there specific foods or supplements that can be added to their meals to keep their bones strong and healthy to hopefully keep arthritis at bay? So any any recommendations there? Well, um, I'm not gonna tell you any supplements because most of the formulated diets uh, have been researched and formulated to give the birds exactly what they need. If 
you want to make sure that your bird is getting everything it needs and you have questions or concerns, that is when you go to your vet and you have blood work done. That blood work will tell you what you need. Your vet will assist you in getting that. There are supplements online. I don't recommend any of those unless talking to your vet. So that's, that's just dangerous to start adding things because over supplementation is just as bad as not enough. Okay. Okay. And let's see if we have time for a couple more, one or two, at least. Um... Also know that they're, they're older birds, um, younger birds too. Uh, but a lot of times older birds, they can also get cancer. Um, there's a lot of things they can get just like we do as we age. Um, I just didn't touch on that because, you know, I'm not a vet. So I, and I, I haven't had experience with that. Thank God. Um, so you, you, that's something you probably want to discuss with your vet. Okay. Oh, and someone asked, uh, sorry, someone wants to know what brand of cages you have. They're all different. Uh, let me move this a little bit. Okay. So that first one there, that is going to be uh, a Featherland cage. Okay. Second one, the shorter one with the play top, that is going to be a Liberty cage. They no longer make that. And then the other ones are going to be um, Featherland. And then a dome one behind Emma is moving around on her perch up there. That's going to be Avian Adventures and they no longer make that either. So um, there are some good options out there for stainless steel cages. I have my favorites. <laughs> um, so if you want to contact me uh, separately, we can go over some good and bad about different stainless cages so I can try to guide you to the right one. Okay. And, and if, at the beginning of the webinar, um, your beginning slide, was, was that, that was in your RV? Is that right? Yes. So do you have yeah. separate cages in there? I mean, that was a fabulous RV setup, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You have, to, you have to walk us through that sometime. That's that's pretty spot. But are those separate cages, or do you wheel any of these cages into the RV? Is it how do you manage that? They are my night cages. So you know, we were only in there for three days, and it was the the first time I really had the birds in there, and it was kind of out of necessity. I didn't have a choice because it got down to thirty nine degrees here. So there was two options I had to keep my birds warm. One, I had the oil filled radiator. Um, that's been burned off for years, but I turned it on and noticed the birds were sneezing. So I didn't feel comfortable with that. And then I could kind of see the heat in the air. It was kind of weird because I could see like waves, whether that was the fumes from the oil or the heat going into the cold air. I don't know. I saw something and it was like the air was like moving and I didn't feel comfortable with that. So I do have the heat panels on top of the cages. So um, I use that on their, on, I moved all the big cages into the little room and I had um, them in there because it it's easier for me to keep warm. And I used the heat panels for one night while I got down to 39. Then I had no option. I had to get the birds out of the house because of the smell of the new furnace going in. And we went into the RV. I took their little sleep cages. Um, there's some important takeaways I've, I've learned from having them in there. Uh, that's not the setup I want to have if if we travel. Um, it's not optimum, but that was quick and what I needed to do. I think we were all very happy to get back in the house. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I probably a reminder that if you are playing like an epic road trip with your flock, maybe do a dry run so you can kind of you can kind of rule out the little things you want to change for the big trip or something. <laughs> I've learned that shade is important for anybody who travels in an RV because at night it got down to 39 in the RV during the day. It got up to, I think the highest was 86 because we don't have any shade in our yard. So that's a big difference. If the heat system didn't work or I couldn't keep them warm enough, that's, that's you're talking 50 degrees difference and that's yeah. not good for the birds. So yeah, a lot of takeaways yeah. with that little experiment. Okay, and we have a question from Cindy. Uh, wants to know, do older birds get colder and or have difficulty regulating their temperature? That's kind of a good segue here. Uh, and um, can you, and, and if you can post the info on the heaters in your group, um, the group chat. Yes. So yeah, so older birds. Yeah. Are um, 
I would think, I mean, that's an excellent question for a veterinarian because they've studied that a little bit more. Um, I do notice my older gray, Sterling, his feet might be a little bit colder or he might shiver a little bit more than the other ones. I don't know is if that's the arthritis. I don't know if it's the age. I, I don't know what it is. Um, I just know I try to keep the temperature at a certain, you know, certain range. There's usually about a five degree difference. Um, so that one, I, I honestly can't answer. Okay. Uh, and then we have a question. Um, how to find a flat or platform perch um, uh, in, a, in a pet store? They, they, they looking for suggestions on where you can find one of those besides online. So um, shoot me an email, reach out to me. I'll look up some links and I'll send them to you. That's probably the easiest. I can tell you to go here and look, but I don't know if they have them myself. So if I go and look at them, I can say, yeah, here they have it. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and, oh, wow. So, okay. So I need to, I need now today's winner. That went by quick. Uh, today's winner um, of our, of our giveaway, which is going to be, guess, guess what it's going to be. It's going to be um, the Fieber Nutriberry, uh, Senior Bird Nutriberries. Um, so that, uh, is going to go out to Jennifer Hart. So congratulations, Jennifer, you and your bird are going to get, um, some senior bird Nutriberries as well as another Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. So, I uh, hope that makes your weekend and your bird's weekend. Um, and, and I think people have asked before, but, um, senior bird Nutriberries, they are especially beneficial to older parrots, but they can also be fed to parrots of all ages. So that, there you go. Um, and uh, okay, well, Lisa, we would we, thank you for, I mean, we, we just flew through that hour as always. <laughs> um, and thank you for, for jumping on with us. Uh, we'll see you, well, we're gonna see you next month, right? <laughs> yep, that's gonna be Ask Lisa Anything. Almost ask anything. Lisa Anything, almost anything. All right, bird related. So, ask Lisa Anything bird related. Yes, there you go. go. And, and I wanna, again, I wanna thank everybody who sent in pictures. I hope I represented your birds well. Um, I know they're part of the family and you're all looking forward to it. So thank you. Absolutely. And um, oh, just a sneak preview for next next Friday. Uh, we are going to be on with Pamela Clark and she's we're continuing the theme of older birds. She's going to uh, walk us through the the tips and tricks for adopting an older bird. So. Um, all right. On that note, everyone, I'm going to say have a great weekend. Everyone stay safe. All the best to you and your flock. Lisa, thank you once again. Fabulous presentation. A lot of good takeaways. Thank you. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye.